Greetings. Welcome to this evening's pre-concert conversation with the flutist Emmanuel Pahoud and the pianist Alessio Bax. Tonight's concert is extraordinary for many reasons, and I'd like to thank the library and my colleagues in the music division for helping make it happen. First, we have two of the world's top musicians here in conversation and in concert in the first of two of their U.S. recitals this season. We will also hear the U.S. premiere of a new piece for flute and piano by the French composer Nicolas Bacri, dedicated to our musicians this evening and in honor of the highly esteemed um, flutist Jean-Pierre Rampal, who would be 100 this year and who has played here multiple times. And above all, we are here to celebrate a concert goer like you, Eleanor D. Sosny. She came to our concerts in the evenings after her days as an attorney at the Securities and Exchange Commission. She enjoyed her concerts with her dear friend, Professor Henretta, who joins us this evening, along with her sister, Diane, family members, and friends. And so we are gathered here for this remarkable event because of Eleanor de Sosny, her love of music at the library and her generosity. With the thoughtfulness and guidance of Professor Henrada, tonight we are able to inaugurate the Eleanor D. Sosny Fund for Music in the Library of Congress, a new endowment to support the Dayton C. Miller Collection and Chamber Music Concerts. Thank you, Professor. <laughs> According to Gramophone, you are one of the most remarkable young pianists now before the public. You play in recital, chamber music, and concertos, and you have appeared in front of hundreds of orchestras, and you teach on the faculty, the piano faculty at New England Conservatory. I know that you graduated when you were 14 from the conservatory in Italy. Um, I, I want to know what was your path to the conservatory? Well, first of all, thank you and Gramophone for the young. <laughs> <laughs> I really, really appreciate that nowadays. Um, the path to the conservatory, well, my parents uh, loved music, but they were not musicians. And it just so happened that uh, uh, during a Christmas uh, season, I was seven years old, they went to the local toy store and bought me a little keyboard, just a two octaves of a keyboard, and I, I absolutely adored it, you know. Up until then, I wanted to be like every Italian, I grew up in Italy, um, I wanted to be a soccer star. <laughs> and uh, just a few months of, of my, my friends running around me with the ball, I realized that was not my thing. So the, uh, the next, uh, next thing, you know how children go from one, one um, obsession to the next and so on. And then was music. And somehow that never, never changed. The little keyboard kind of grew to a bigger keyboard as I, as I grew and then eventually, uh, eventually a piano. Uh, eventually, actually, I wanted to be an organist first. Oh. Uh, I loved the music of Bach, and uh, when it was time to enter the conservatory, um, you were supposed to take five years of piano before they let you switch on to the organ, which absolutely I did not want to do until I started and I just fell in love with so much uh, great repertoire that's written for piano. And, and here I am. And I here you kept, are. kept doing it, yeah. Oh, that's lovely. Um, actually, why did you come here in, to the United States? Um, it was after I was, um, I came when I was 16, so two years after I graduated, I finished my studies early in Italy and had met a wonderful teacher from Spain, uh, Joaquina Chucaro, who's just turned 90 and still performing a full concert uh, schedule. Um, I met him in Siena, in, uh, in Tuscany, for, during some master classes and absolutely fell in love with his teaching. I thought it was a great fit and decided to move um, first to Dallas, where he happened to teach when he was not touring. So I didn't know anything about, uh, I didn't know much about the country, I didn't know anything about Texas and Dallas, and I just, <laughs> I just followed him, and um, I feel I learned so much. That's great, there was a mentor. Um, you have been awarded the Avery Fisher Career Grant. Can you tell us what that is, and how that might have affected you, or what you did with that? 
Um, well, it's interesting. That was a while back, but it was just after I had moved to New York. So I finished my study. I actually stayed in Texas for a long time to be close to my teacher, even after I graduated. And then I realized that I had only lived in Bari in southern Italy and in Dallas, and I was traveling a lot, and it kind of made sense to, to go to the big town, <laughs> to the Big Apple, and I decided to move to New York. And uh, just a few months after the move, I got this phone call that I was awarded this career grant, which is um, basically... Um, well, it comes twofold. Of course, there is uh, uh, recognition for being part of the few ones right. that won this yeah. award, and then um, it's, it's cash that can be used for um, for plans for career. And, and just having just moved in New York kind of um, gave me a lot of encouragement personally. That was a great honor. Keep, wow. To keep um, doing what I was doing. Wow, that's great. Um, speaking of um, honors that you have, you're also a Steinway artist. Um, how did you get that distinction, and what does that mean? That's, that's quite actually. It's not. It's quite common. I mean, I love Steinways, and and I guess they don't mind me. Right. Um, they didn't give you one when you uh, with no, the no. no. Uh, 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 I thought maybe you got a Steinway for. <laughs> Which, well, we have one for you tonight. You yeah, know, nice <laughs> you can't take um, it. No, it just it just comes with a few perks. If you're playing yeah. somewhere that that doesn't have a Steinway, you you can have one there, and and you have a choice of great instruments when you're in the big cities. Oh, wow. Um, but but there's many of us. I know, I know. I just was very curious about that. Um, okay, great. I should turn to our, our flutist now. Um, I'll, I'll read what The Guardian has said about you. Um, <laughs> <laughs> you have a golden flowing tone on the flute. Um, I think that's true. I heard you rehearse. Um, you live in Berlin. You play principal flute with the Berlin Philharmonic Orchestra. Um, I should mention the orchestra is here in the U.S. now for the first time with the new conductor. Is that correct? Yes, yeah. that's right. Uh, okay. <laughs> Currently, they're in Boston on a day off. Ah. Yeah. Ah. That's what allowed me to come here to D.C. Aren't we lucky? Thank you. That was wonderful. Um, you do appear internationally as a soloist um, and a chamber music uh, musician. You record extensively. A major contribution to uh, the flute. Uh, catalog. Um, and also, um, you founded a lovely and very unique summer festival in Provence. So we want to hear about all of those things. But first, let's go back to your childhood also. Um, <laughs> your parents are French and Swiss. You were born in Geneva. And due to your father's work, you moved around a lot. And then you went to Rome where something amazing, pivotal, fortuitous happened. Lucky you. Tell yeah. us about that. Rome is one of those places you just go there and you come back transformed. Uh, Woody Allen documented this beautifully in one of his uh, uh, recent movies in the last decade. But uh, to me, it was, as a child, a wonderful experience because I discovered something that I didn't know before, and that's called music. <laughs> My neighbors were musicians, had four children learning a different musical instruments, and I had no idea what the sounds were that were coming out of the walls. But I was starting to hum that one thing, that next thing I do when I meet my neighbor in the staircase. I ask, uh, what's this song? And I start singing what they, they then told me is the Mozart flute concerto. <laughs> and I said, I want to play the Mozart flute concerto. <laughs> and there we go. Uh, the next morning, I get my first flute lesson, more or less. Yeah. Oh my gosh, how old were you? I was five years old. And How tall uh, were you? Um, I was really tiny. How, how, how big was the flute? Uh, the flute was much bigger than I was, so I could <laughs> just barely reach the, the mouth hole here, and I could not produce a sound in the first lesson. I was so happy, I was smiling big time. Oh, that's and, and I just like... <laughs> there was no way I would control anything coming out of that instrument. So it took me a while to, to get first to know the... to learn the, to read music. Uh, on a recorder, on a simple, simple mm -hmm. uh, recorder flute. I mean, simple. Uh, it's a quick thing to say because uh, in order to make music on any kind of instrument, it just takes a lifetime. Uh, but it was easier to to, to learn first how to read uh, music this way, and then growing a little bit at age six was already much bigger. Um, then I could really start um, the proper instrument. Yeah. So who taught you flute then, when you were six? Uh, my neighbor. Yeah, oh, your neighbor yeah, continued yeah, to yeah, teach yeah, you? Yeah. Oh, oh, how wonderful. 
And uh, yeah, growing, taking it from there, basically 10 years later, I performed for the first time the Mozart Flute Concerto oh, with orchestra on stage. Oh my gosh. After winning a competition, I was living in Brussels by that time with my parents. And uh, another 10 years later, age 25, I was recording it with uh, Claudio Abado and, uh, and the Berlin Philharmonic for my first debut album with the MI Classics in those years. Oh, what a tribute. Now called Warner Classics. It's the same, basically the same label, same company. And in the meantime, we've been doing over 35 albums um, together with them, recital, concerto, modern music, old music, jazz, uh, whatever. I mean, anything with flute, I can do. It's great. I mean... I if you could pick th three of those recordings, what should, what should the audience go out and buy tomorrow? Like, th there's so many wonderful different styles and collaborations in, in your list. I, I like the three last ones because all of them are double ones, <laughs> double albums, so you get oh. more, you get <laughs> you more get music more. for the same money. <laughs> Um, but also they depict a little bit more of what, uh, what how, how to think about music today. It was different, you know, when I started in the 90s, there was no internet. Um, there was barely facsimile communication, this kind of thing. So uh, just the world was going at a different speed and we were dealing with music, with repertory, uh, with uh, just the, the relationship between musician and audience and repertoire was very different to what, to, to what has become today. And I find it fascinating that today we can really develop concepts about music making. So it, one of them is, for example, it's called Mozart and Flute in Paris. And half of the album is Mozart in Paris and works that feature the flute also. It's the flute and harp concerto. It's another mm. wind concertante. So it's symphonic music with the flute in Paris. And it's a form that he learned in Paris. He didn't know there was not existing in Salzburg. It was not existing in Mannheim. It was not from the Germanic world. It was really the French kind of music making. But also, half of the other half of the album is works by Cécile Chaminade, by Saint-Saëns, by Poulenc, uh, by uh, living composer Philippe Ersan, for example, who wrote a piece. All of this music originated in Paris and has to do with the history, with the flute being such a, an eminently French instrument in its modern development. Right, and actually speaking of Paris then, you did go to the Paris Conservatory. Yes, I did. I still had a lot to learn before and after. Um, but uh, this, is, this is basically where you learn um, how to play the flute according to the, the that school. That uh, still is today right. the, the top school. Uh, they produce prize winners in, in competitions every year. Uh, just because the technical standard and the repertoire standard, the whole concept of how this, these academics are made uh, there um, is, uh, is really fantastic and scales and arpeggios, all these wonderful things that we then later on use in, uh, in the repertoire, in the music, uh, from Bach to Prokofiev sure. actually. Scales You're gonna right hear it from Beethoven, Bach, uh, Prokofiev and even Bakri, a lot of scales and a lot of arpeggios in the program tonight. So you have to know those. With yeah, the you're gonna make you music know? out of every note, you know, right. also in these exercises, but just the mastery of the instrument, the control of that is something that you learn really very well in that school. Who was your teacher there? Um, one of my teachers was uh, Michel de Bost in uh, the beginning, uh, uh, half American, half French, right. and who's then later on been uh, um, retiring from Paris and teaching in Oberlin, Ohio, mm -hmm. at the Conservatory of Music, and uh, assisting him was his wife, um, Kathleen Chastain. Uh, mm -hmm. from St. Louis, right. mm -hmm. and um, then once he had left, I, I changed uh, the class in the conservatory and learned with Alain Marion, who was the disciple of Jean-Pierre Rampal, right. mm -hmm. whom we're celebrating tonight yes. in our program yes. with uh, Jean-Pierre, uh, with, uh, with a Bacri, Nicolas Bacri uh, piece that's dedicated to his memory. And l later on, just before going to Berlin, I had lessons also with Aurel Nicolet, who was my predecessor in the Berlin Orchestra in the Furtwängler years. Mm -hmm. So that's back in the 50s, mm -hmm. something like that. Um, and uh, he also studied in Paris and then later on got a job in Berlin. Nicolet. Yeah, yeah. Nicolet. So it was uh, amazing how 50 years later he was the one to guide To me guide you through there. Through those steps. And you got in. You made it. You auditioned for the orchestra? Well, you know, I can play good or bad on that day, but in the end, it's them making the decision. It was very impressive to see Claudio Abado sitting there, but surrounded by 50, 60 musicians, because this is how they make the decision. It's uh, the, the orchestra sitting in the hall, in the Philharmonic Hall, and listening to 
20 um, flute players who are invited and play first round of a Mozart concerto again. Oh, wow. Here but it comes this again. time I didn't play theme? that one. I didn't oh, play oh. the, 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 the concerto. Uh, that was the reason why I started playing the flutes. I played the other one and it was the first time I was playing it publicly. I oh. just wanted to go f full risk and just to go f have a fresh approach approach at it and not just uh, do something that is consummate, you know, in a, in a, uh -huh. in a way. And because I was a bit worried of with whom I would have to deal with on the piano, because you never know who's going to be the accompanist for the audition. I had prepared a second round with a piece of choice, and that's how it, they, call, they call it there, and, and I chose Berio Sequenza for mm. Flute Alone. Uh, that was a bit <laughs> daring, because automatically you put yourself beyond comparison. That can be positive or it can be negative. Right, right. Um, but then when, <laughs> when I came for the audition, the pianist was Philip Moll. Oh. <laughs> yeah. So I could have easily played a Schubert or right, Prokofiev right, or, right. Uh, you know, any kind of the, the great repertoire that he played together with James with Galway so Galway, successfully. Yeah, and yeah. that charmed my ears as a teenager also because I got all of them recordings. And these people brought me to, from a kid liking to play the flute to, to the stage and actually perform those works. And Galway played with Yes, them Galway too, right? also played uh, with the uh, Berlin Philharmonic. He was also my predecessor uh, in the 70s. And uh, carry on. Um, uh, so that was, but he stayed there like six, seven years. Right, right. Yeah, and then left for a solo career. Right. Um, did you ever think about that? Like when you were, what? what? All the time, every morning. Uh, uh. <laughs> and you know what I do? I just turn around and close my eyes while I'm sleeping. <laughs> no, but it's really, it's a no brainer for me. If I had wanted to choose, I would have done this a long time ago. Uh, first of all, we are two principal flutes nowadays, and we can coordinate the season. We can oh. split the season. So, so you can uh, do Provence in the summer? Yeah, and, and also Berlin is not a closed city as it was before. When Galway or Nicolet were there, it was a city that was shut away from the mm. world, you know? Yeah. You had to fly, but it was not that easy in those years. Or it was so much more complicated to get the authorizations to come in, to come out, etc. Uh, nowadays, it's so much more convenient, except for the last three years, which where it's been a little more complicated. Um, but uh, yeah, that's one of the advantages of modern life. And we do decide who is playing um, this week or that mm -hmm. week in the Carian years. He was deciding who is playing which week because it's being recorded, and he would determine exactly with whom he wanted to play. Now this has changed. It's more of a kind of um, orchestra republic in a way, and we manage um, this ourselves. Oh, that's so great for all the many things that you do that you can balance that. I was wondering about that. Um, back to to the orchestra, though, you were only 22. I mean, you were so young, right? The youngest player? In that moment, I was the youngest player, and three months later came another guy who was two, two days younger than me. Oh. <laughs> He plays the low horn in the orchestra. Um, and uh, then a year later came another guy who was 17 years old. His mother had to sign the contract. <laughs> oh my God. <laughs> he plays double bass. <laughs> but yeah, we like to hire people young. We also have an academy program mm. uh, so that we can, you know, we can train the people in our way of playing. It's a very international orchestra in the same, at the same time, only not even half the musicians are German unlike uh, tra more traditional orchestras like Vienna Philharmonic, for mm -hmm. example, or, uh, or even Concerto Bau in Amsterdam, if we take uh, European orchestras in the comparison. So it has always been pretty international and pretty open-minded, but, but what we like to do is to take the people young and train them our way. I'm, I'm not ignoring you. I just have one more question. I, I have to ask for all the flute people out here, so, what was your first flute that you played on? Uh, if I remember well, it was a Yamaha. Ah, okay. Uh, That's a, a good student basic model. student. Yeah, right? very, um, very good instrument. Okay. I was lucky. <laughs> no, th th it's really the kind of instrument that you can... It's perfect, If yeah. anything happens to my golden flute that I'm playing tonight, uh, right. and I could pick up a Yamaha student model flute, and it would do the job up to a certain point. Right, right. Yeah. Right. Um, I remember DeBose telling me that once, actually, <laughs> with his closed hold C foot flute. That, um, and so, what do you play but, now? What is that? But I heard that you, you got a, quite a collection of instruments <laughs> here, you know, <laughs> just as a, as a callback option. Okay. <laughs> 
Actually, there's a gold flute right in there. It's a 22 karat gold with 18 karat keys. But it's at 435, so that wouldn't really work for oh, tonight. Yeah, then we would have to tune the piano also. Right, right. Yeah. <laughs> we spent all day doing that already. Let's not do that again. Um, yeah, we have a, um, almost 2,000 um, um, here in the collection, as uh, many people have heard recently. This is the flute capital of the world. And this is the year of the flute here at the Library of Congress, apparently. Um, you too have made this happen. And so what is that gold flute of yours? Who made that one? Um, my, I now play American instruments. So I bought in 1989 after winning several competitions. Um, I had enough money and I bought what was the state of the art in that moment. That was a Brandon Cooper flute made mm -hmm. in Boston right, yeah. together with a Sheridan head joint also mm -hmm. made in Boston. And that's the one I'm playing tonight. It's my favorite instrument to go on tour and to cover the entire range of what I've been performing mm -hmm recording throughout those years. Uh, but now it's a vintage instrument because I've been playing it every day for the last 33 years. And sometimes it needs to go for repair uh, and spend a couple of weeks uh, with, a, with a flute repairman. And uh, I also have a Haynes flute from Boston. That's really excellent. Um, they, they reinvented their own instruments like five years ago, 10 years ago. They called it the Renaissance model. And I find them really beautiful instruments. And I think they, they would work beautifully also in such a recital format like today. The Haynes uh, brothers, um, especially William Haynes, were very close with the flute collector. And um, they went back and forth on you know, advice on the flutes and stuff. So we do have quite a few Haynes flutes in the collection. Um, okay, so what are some things we should listen for in this evening's program? Who wants to start on that? We can start with the Beethoven, maybe. And I mean, there's so much in this program. I mean, it's really like a, um, a wealth of, 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 of everything that's about music. I mean, from Bach to Bakri and Prokofiev and Beethoven. Um, it's hard to pick what to, to listen for. I mean, there's um, such variety, I think. I mean, I, I really love this program. I can't wait to, to go through it and see how it feels. Now, for, we've rehearsed, of course, but for the first time for an audience. It's quite a journey, though. So, like with the Beethoven, um, you did the transcription from the violin sonata? Well, I basically play the violin music. The, right. Yeah, right. and if there's a few notes that are too low for me, I just go an octave higher, and if that's then in unison with the piano, Alessio kindly goes an octave lower, so that we have exactly the same notes, but just um, um, spread uh, differently across the, the two instruments. But that's just like a few bars. Otherwise, it's, uh, it's really the same music, and it's uh, quite a conversational uh, piece. Right, it's a great piano part, right? It's not just... It's, it's a great song. I mean, I've played with violin a lot, and, and you know, the amazing thing of playing with someone like Emmanuel, that he, he's just, just a great musician, and that happens to play the flute, and, but you don't... <laughs> and I know there are many flutists here, but you don't notice the instrument at some point, which is amazing. And and then to play, um, on the other hand, to play this with a different instrument than I'm used to, you, you really get to the core of the of the music as well. Because so there's, the there's not the violin in the way, it's something else, and, and the ultimate goal, it, it's exactly the same. Right, so you've played with a uh, violinist on it and with flute. So are there differences just in the breathing through the flute or the phrases or the bowing that come into that when you're accompanying? Or it's not really yeah, I mean, accompaniment it's a so much as... for Emmanuel, I think. I mean, I think eventually you're not supposed to hear those things, right? Uh, bowings or breathings. And, and so, so it's, it's all, at the end, for me, it's about the music itself. I mean, there are differences, but it's, it's, it's about the music, really. Yeah, so certainly there, there are differences in, um, in the texture of the sound, in uh, the, the, what you can achieve on the one or the other instrument. But uh, let's remember something also at the same time is that when you liked a piece of music in the times of Bach, Vivaldi, Mozart, Beethoven, Schubert, etc., you would, you would just play it on your own mm -hmm. instrument and play it for the, for the people you, know, you like in, the, in, your, in your space. And that, that's what we're doing still today in many ways. So. It's the official word is transcription, transcribed by, etc. But actually, it's just like sharing the love for this and the, the passion for this music. I think it works beautifully on the on the, on the, this instrument. 
unlike some of the other sonatas, I tried uh, mm -hmm. all of them before discarding um, ninety percent of them. Ah. Yeah, because they just wouldn't work as uh, as much as I love the beginning of the spring sonata. Once the first phrase is over, it doesn't work at all on the flute. Um, because we don't have the double stops, we cannot just reply to the piano with the with the right uh, ping pong energy, uh, or nor the sustain and the lower passages, etc. The G major sonata works beautifully, and uh, this way um, I love playing it with Alessio. Also. And also for me, it's so enriching to play, not just in the uh, in the situation of the virtuoso with the with an accompanist, but to have right, equal part, equal in, the part in this. Uh, music making and this is uh, really something that that is so enriching to also to I love to stand in the middle of the piano not on the side so I can be in Alessio's sound you know and be surrounded by this music making this is really some a great experience and the acoustics are so great in the auditorium that will be quite quite great um that's wonderful um what about the Bach what to listen for in that piece anything well, what is new to me is actually the second time I'm playing it on stage with a, with a pianist. I usually play Bach with a harpsichord. Uh. Um, the sonata is obligato, so without a cello. And the first time I played it was with Sir Andras Schiff. Actually, it's the third time, sorry. <laughs> the second time was, was with a birthday boy, Daniel Barenboim, who's turning 80 today. Oh. In Europe, it's midnight already, this is why. <laughs> um, and, and the third time now is with Alessio Pax. Okay. Um, <laughs> today, <laughs> no, and it's great music making. I mean, it's it's uh, it's uh, a very different blend. There, it's I do have to adjust because the phrasing, the power, uh, the range of the instruments, the sound of the keyboard, of the modern keyboard, is is quite different in the attack and sustain to what it was on the harpsichord. But Bach himself, whenever they, 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 they he had a chance, he would go for the new instruments. He traveled three days to try out the new forte pianos or the new organ. A um, uh, composer is always writing new music um, in their times, basically, and going for the experiments and for the new, uh, for, for, for the new features, for the newest developments. Uh, for me, the Bach was such a discovery, because, you know, of course, I played so much Bach, but not so much with flute. We played another sonata together on the previous tour, uh, but this one is so special. I mean, the, the, the first movement is... It, 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 you have a feeling that this Bach is showing every little corner of every little thing and going from one place to the next and the, the, um, weaving the melodies between the, uh, not only the flute and, the, and my part, but between my two hands and then between the flute part. It's quite, quite an, in a very unexpected way. And there's so much beauty, intensity, and, and so much fun in the last movement as well. Uh, it's really one of the major works, I would say. Well, I guess we should talk about the U.S. premiere that we're going to hear tonight for Flute and Piano by Nicholas Bakri. Um, he, um, as many of you might not know, um, he is from Paris. He's quite young also. Um, he went to the conservatory. He was born in 1961, and he has written other works for flute, solo, chamber, orchestral works. Um, but this one was a special one. Um, because of Jean-Pierre Rompal. Do you want to talk a little bit about that? Then? Yes, the, the flute world, but more specifically the French Flute Society, uh, is, has been celebrating this year the 100th anniversary of uh, Jean-Pierre Rampal. There was a special publication about his biography. Um, there was a whole flute festival that was happening now in October, over a week, uh, where all of the concerts were in a way dedicated to his legacy. Uh, by students of his or people who took over some repertoire ideas uh, from from the older transcription, all the new works that he originated. And uh, this is where uh, the, the commission and the idea behind this work was originated actually years ago. And then came COVID and, uh, and the whole thing, because it was supposed to be for the 20th anniversary of his death in the beginning, but then we had to postpone. And fortunately, two years after that year, that was the 100th yeah. anniversary of his birth. Um, and um, so, so it's a, it's a, how can I say, Nicolas Bacri is a, a very traditional composer in many ways. Mm. Uh, his music is quite tonal, actually. Uh, a little bit naive even sometimes, uh, but is always referring to the great maestros from the past. And the beginning is very much the first movement. It's, it could be a piece by Dutilleux, 
And it's dedicated yeah. to. Yeah. 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 And he was, he was, that was his uh, great master, and he also dedicated this and to the memory of Dutiu. Um, the last movement could very well fit in a Prokofiev suite. For example, so I think it just fits beautifully in this uh, in this uh, in this program, from Bach to Bakri. Um, <laughs> uh, but uh, yeah, I think even even though you don't you've never heard this music before, because it's going to be the first time on this continent, you will feel very familiar with it during the concerts. And also, the music is structured in, in a way that the theme is repeating again, is coming again later in, this, in the movement. So there's a recapitulation. And then you hear the same music for the second time, so it's not new anymore. You know? um, yeah, and the whole structure is beautifully made, beautifully crafted, and very elegant. I think you will enjoy this. That sounds exciting. Uh, yeah. Do you want to add anything I mean, to no, this? Not much to add, except I mean, we've played it um, uh, for the first time in Italy in the summer, and then uh, in, in Salon de Provence, in, in the Manuel's festival with the composer there so we, oh, we oh. you know we had we talked to him and we were part of the piece had some sort of evolution over the years because it was first written in 2020 mm -hmm. and uh, from the first draft m mostly i mean the, the material is pretty much the same mostly um, formally you know this in structure and i think this is probably the version now yeah. <laughs> yes the, exactly the one that will get printed yes it is uh, it is printed already uh, oh. and uh, this is what we are playing yeah yeah Great, wonderful. I guess from uh, Ron Paul then and Prokofiev, um, he played Prokofiev here when he premiered the Poulenc here in 1958. Um, let's talk about that wonderful piece. Yeah, because that, that piece was actually made famous as the second violin sonata. Right. Uh, because it was discarded by Prokofiev uh, after a terrible first performance in Moscow <laughs> and left in a drawer. and. Um, uh, David Oistrak was once at Prokofiev's house in the year following that performance, that failure of the first performance of the flute sonata that was reputedly unplayable then. And, and he said, oh, what is this? Looks like oh, nice stuff for the violin, so shall we try? And they started playing this together. He changed a few things, and it was published and made famous as, a f as the second violin sonata. And then when Rampal heard this, I think it was in the Prague Spring Festival, uh, he heard this performance for the first time and heard about the genesis of the piece. Mm. He said, okay, now let's, uh, let's uh, practice and let's get this uh, done properly on the flutes. And this is how it was reinstated at the flute, as the flute sonata by Prokofiev. So thanks to both of these uh, uh, great artists, um, Rampal on the one side for his marvelous generosity and artistry, and the other, on the other side for the curiosity of Oistrak. Uh, and, okay. and just the dedication that both of them have also to, if they believe in a piece of music, just to perform it on stage, whether it's been written yesterday or 200 years ago, it doesn't matter. If they believe, you know, then they go on stage and they burn for it. And this is something so exemplary. It has been such a strong impression on me as a kid when I saw such artists coming on stage. Um, I can be only so incredibly thankful when I think of them. Wow. Um, thank you for that. Do you Either of you want to add anything else, or should I open up the floor to some questions? Okay. All right, <clears throat> Andrew Kalima host, and uh, I've seen some of the flutes in the collection, and it's a wonderful collection. If you had your choice of any of the flutes that you know of in this collection, which one would you want to play for a concert? <laughs> there are many wonderful flutes. Give me some time and have an in-depth look at a collection. I will be able to answer that question. I just came from the train station straight into this building <laughs> to rehearse today. He didn't have time to <laughs> really, stop in. That's, okay. that's the only honest answer I can give you. Very good. Yeah. Thank you very much. Oh, uh, David. Oh, oh, okay. Have you had a chance to beat Jean-Pierre Rampal or Claude Bowling? And have you played the suite for jazz, uh, flute and piano? Maybe as an encore tonight, you could do that. Ah! <laughs> <laughs> uh, 
Uh, yes, well, the answer is yes to nearly everything. Um, <laughs> <laughs> I have met uh, Jean-Pierre Rampal and played together with him, shared stage a few times also. He was old and his knees were aching and uh, his breath was getting short also in the end. And uh, it was, he was happy to be on stage, but it was not necessarily uh, the happiest times on stage for him. Uh, yet I've heard him before that, also as a teenager, uh, really in wonderful recitals and concerto moments, and had some, uh, just two, two, three lessons with him, or saw him in master classes also, it was a great experience. I met Claude Bolling also separately, because um, I have been playing a few times, either with a jazz trio, with Jackie Terrason, for example, but also with the pianist Eric Lesage, with whom I've, recording so, I've been recording so much on tour. We have often played the, one of the bowling movements as an encore. Tonight we have another surprise for you, if you bear with us until the end of the program. <laughs> <laughs> I, think, I think we will. Yeah. Anyone else have another question? If you were a young person today and you wanted to become a performance flutist, what would you do to make your career come along? You know, I have children myself. <laughs> <laughs> They're not musicians, so that was a full success. <laughs> <laughs> But no, I realized that very often, uh, I remember when it was like, they were 15, 16, 17 years old, I was thinking, how can I help them best to, to prepare for the future? And I was realizing that a lot of the things I see dark clouds in the future, which they don't see. They grow up in a world that is, that is different than ours, and uh, all the things that were certain for us, that was for sure, when we had the same age, are different now from a different perspective. But we gotta um, help the kids, of course, um, uh, the young artists. Um, the, the main difference is that now they have access to so much information. It's so easy to see so much crap. And, uh, you know, how to clean, clean up a little bit the path. And uh, this is where the teachers, the, the, the because you can follow so many channels online. Uh, but of course, if you go to a concert and see a live experience, it's a different uh, thing that's happening. It's really time, experience, shared, lived together. It's a very different thing than, than just watching something on the screen. Actually, when I see uh, information such as a schedule for me uh, for the next years on an iPhone or on a, or a smartphone or a tablet or computer. I don't memorize the information. If I write it down on a piece of paper in a calendar, I do memorize this. So it's a very different process. And it's not just my generation. It's true for, for, for younger people also. So just to rewrite sometimes the music, the pieces that you like, and really learn how to, to, to make music happen this way also, and not just by... Uh, being like a butterfly, you know? I think this is really something more in depth. Take the time to make more in depth uh, research and these kind of things. I think this is how we can help them most because there are so many temptations to do so many things at the same time, but nothing really in depth. Really coming to concerts, I think too, hearing, hearing musicians, all types of musicians. I mean, you have a daughter does she, and a yes, wife who plays piano. Yeah. And, uh, yeah, yeah. Are you a musical trio or a duo? I mean, I think music education is one of the most important things uh, a, a child can receive. And uh, unfortunately, as, as Emmanuel was saying, I mean, now, nowadays young people and kids are distracted in so many different directions because there are so many opportunities so easily accessible. And, and sometimes these uh, resources, even for music, for example, are not, not used efficiently or not used well because it's just so easy to go on YouTube and find any historical recording. But how many young people actually do that? Um, for us, I mean, we had to really, uh, really make an effort. And then, when once you make an effort, you do things more, slightly more in depth. And so, for my daughter, for example, I want to expose her to as much music. And she's singing in the Metropolitan Opera, of course. She's playing yeah. a bit of piano. She's hating to practice. Um, more than I remember me hating to practice, so I don't know. But, but if she doesn't have a chance now, and she's not encouraged by the parents, then probably everybody will regret it eventually. So 
And I see already, I mean, the amazing things that music uh, education does to a child's uh, brain and mind and mm -hmm. flexibility. So Absolutely. it's a joy to see. I do hope we can get more young people to be inspired like both of you were at such a young age, you know, and find music in whatever way. If it's not professional, it's a part of their... Um, anyone else have a question? I have a question. Ah. Speaking of screens, can you both talk about the impact of COVID and the lockdown on your performance careers? Um, well, well, it really came to, to a halt for me. Uh, especially in, in, you know, I live in New York, and I think in the States we suffered um, more than in Europe at the beginning of COVID. Uh, everything was locked down. You couldn't go to a concert hall to, um, you couldn't have really distance concert in most venues, um, or not even go for recordings. And uh, meanwhile, we were looking at, at, uh, at Europe um, and Berlin, for example. I mean, they, they, um, they started concerts quite early without, without an audience, thanks to the digital concert hall. Um, so it was quite, um, I mean, uh, there's of course silver linings and it's hard to talk about silver linings when so many people, you know, really suffered so much. Um, for me, having a young daughter was wonderful to be at home. Uh, and the, I, I got to practice very little, but the type of practice that I did was fantastic because I didn't have deadlines, so I could dedicate a day to uh, to a phrase if I wanted to, you know, <laughs> usually I don't get that luxury. And then all of a sudden when things restarted, they restarted totally full steam with, in a very chaotic, messy way. And we're very, we're still, I, at least I'm still trying to catch, to catch a breath, but going through it very happily. So that's the short, long story made short. Yeah, pretty much uh, the same uh, thing here, um, except I had planned actually uh, from February 2020, um, just after my 50th birthday, uh, sabbatical. Mm. So I had planned no solo concerts, no tours, no nothing, uh, only orchestra for one year. Uh, so then actually didn't change much in my schedule, except the orchestra bit fell away for a few months. And then we restarted, we reinvented uh, Philharmonic concerts, just only with three people in the beginning there, then with four people, then five, then six, then within two months we had a small orchestra with distancing, but nobody knew uh, what's, what's going to happen, etc. And then in the summer of 2020, we actually uh, did two festivals. Um, we first met in, the, in late July uh, in uh, Alessio's festival in Tuscany, in Contra in Terra di Siena, and then early August in um, our festival in, in the Provence. And it was the only year in 30 years that we've been doing this festival, there was not one change in the program nor in the artists, <laughs> because everybody was available. <laughs> <laughs> So, yeah, there have been some, some moments of really the joy of making music together for an audience that year, from May onwards in Europe. That was just tremendous, mm. after three months of uh, nothing. So I can imagine in the places where it's been uh, lasting longer, uh, what uh, joy and, and what a dreadful period it must have been before that. Uh, but what a joy it must have been also to get together again. And uh, now I think we cherish the, f the, the actual concert much more than before. Yeah. It's uh, a much more intense yeah. situation than it used to be. Um, it's not, you know, yet another one or a business as before or something. No, it's really meaningful and it's really some, something very different. Uh, but also during all this time that we had suddenly, as you said, Alessio, we had time to practice like last time was probably when we were students preparing for competitions, you know, and uh, it did a lot of good to the playing. A lot of cleanup um, in the technical m approach of finding solutions to musical problems, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. So, uh, yeah, we're trying to mes make the most out of it, out of any situation, basically. Great. I think that's it for this evening. Then, thank you so much. <laughs>